years, I work alone. 30 years, I always do the job, and then this week they give me this job and tell me I gotta put on a second gun. My age, you don't make a remark. In this business, they don't retire you to Florida. They don't give you any social security, and you don't get a gold watch. But you do get one day when you're not looking. It's a brief pain in the back of your head glimpse your brains flying out before they scrape you up off the cyber. Eric Red is a Los Angeles-based novelist, screenwriter, and film director. His films include The Hitcher, Near Dark, Cohen and Tate, Body Parts, The Last Outlaw, Bad Moon, and A Hundred Feet. He's written nine novels, I believe, to this uh, date, including Stopping Power and White Knuckle, among many others. And Eric, you've been on my radar for about 30 years, so it's a real treat to, to get to speak with you like this, and I appreciate you coming on. Oh, well, my pleasure. I want to focus on Cohen and Tate. Just real quick, I'd be a uh, fool not to bring up a couple of your prior pictures to that, uh, which would include The Hitcher. I was wondering if you could share any reflections on that film, and in particular, Rucker Howard's performance of your character. Well, you know, The Hitcher was, you know, it was my first uh, produced screenplay. It's actually my first screenplay. Um, and, you know, we got it made at a, at a time in, you know, back in the 80s in Hollywood, um, where the timing was very good to get an original screenplay. There was, uh, there was a lot of support at the time for uh, doing material that was original and new and different. And mm -hmm. um, it, it wound up being a movie where there were a lot of first timers involved when we made it. Um, not the lead producer, Ed Feldman, but you know, the producers, the director, and myself. I, th I thought that they did a very faithful, very solid a version of the script. Why are you doing this to me? You're a smart kid. Figure it out. I didn't do it. Yeah, it's a film, I think, now part of its impact derives from the fact that it's not just a, a bloody serial killer movie, but it's a psychological thriller where the the relationship which is um never fully spelled out uh between the hitcher and the the kid who picks him up and who the, the hitcher torments uh i think that that has sort of allowed the audience to fill in the blanks which makes it uh which it, which i think is a technique that um always works because right. you, you don't explain everything uh the audience figures it out for themselves and they engage, they actively engage with the movie rather than just letting the whole kind of thing wash over them. You know, sort of like John Ryder says to the, to the kid at one point, he says, you know, you're smart, you figure it out. You know, I like <laughs> So that's good, just kind of leave it behind the curtain. You know, it was interesting because, especially in pertaining to Roy Scheider, because both the character of John Ryder and the Hitcher and, and, Shire's character, Cohen, intentionally have no backstory. You know, there's there because when you don't explain um, the backstory to the audience, where you keep that, uh, you know, it, it, it creates a sense of mystery about the character. But in both cases, um, I asked uh, both Roy and, and also Rutger at one point on the set, just because I was curious, not because for any other reason, but I said, you know, what's your backstory? Have you, do, do you have a backstory for yourself on this? And Rutger had none. Rutger, you know, just his, the way he would, he played scenes in the moment, you know. He could have cared less about the backstory. But Scheider had his character worked out from the day he was born. It was phenomenal. For about 15 minutes, he walked me through his backstory for Cohen. 
And, you know, if you've seen the film, you know, and his, his name, Cohen, and he's a loner uh, hitman. You know, sure. had, it basically revolved around him being a Jewish contract killer in the, in the Italian mafia, which for Roy was kind of essential because that's why he, he was alone. That's why he worked alone. But that, right. was the, that was just the tip of the iceberg. He, he had it so worked out. And that, that was kind of the beauty of, 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 of one of the great things about Shatter as an actor was how prepared he was. You know, he, he was really trained out of that whole method acting school in, in you know, New York in the 60s and 70s. And right. just such preparation and detail in his performance. You being, I believe, 26 at the time or, or thereabouts, and being the writer of this movie, it says a lot about you as a director and your, your instincts to have the confidence to let someone mold and shape your story like that. He, he, didn't, cha he, he didn't change the character of the lines of the story. He just had his own personal explanation for himself as an actor about why Cohen was who he was doing what he did in the movie. When we first hired Roy, you know, we were down in Texas and we were getting ready to film. And Shatter uh, came before he accepted the role. He loved the script. But before he accepted the role, he wanted to come down and meet me. You know, I, I think that, you know, movie stars, particularly with first-time directors and first-time writer directors, you know, he had what is a very natural apprehension. You know, he wanted to make sure that I wasn't going to give him line readings. You know, that he would have the room to develop his character properly and to follow his instincts, which is why I, we hired him in the first place. Sure. Um, but Roy and I came down, we had dinner um, with one of the producers, and we, um, I mean, Roy couldn't, you know, he, he couldn't have been more professional and gracious. But, you know, we it was, we, it was really a business meeting. We went down and we went through the script, you know, really mm -hmm. line by line. And everything was going great. I mean, it was a... It, it really was a good meeting. We both saw eye to eye until we didn't. Uh, and Roy suddenly, at one point in the comes in, in the um, in our meeting, said, "You know, I've only got one problem with the script. You know, it's we never. He, it was a big deal for Roy, as he articulated it, um, that we never saw his character, his hitman character, with anybody else but this other hitman and this kid, really." You know, and he felt very strongly, he didn't want his character to appear, come off like a fiend. And he wanted to, it was very important to him to have a scene in the movie where we saw him with other people in his life. So we knew he was a real, you know, human being. Um, but that was a problem for me because the whole movie, if you've seen Cohen and Tate, is really three people in a car. And there's very intentionally no backstory with Cohen and Cohen or Tate. They revealed who they are is revealed in present tense in their through their interactions and how they deal with situations. And to have a scene in the movie, I felt where you actually showed Cohen with a family member or with a friend um, would have destroyed the movie. Uh, you know that that was simply not what this movie was. This movie was really a road movie. You know, on a night highway with three hit with three characters in a car, and I explained that to him. I said, you know, I could not see making this film and breaking the four walls of the picture, so to speak. Um, and we had a moment there where it didn't look like we were going to be working together. I sat and I thought for a minute, and I kind of digested what um, what Schrader was getting at, what he wanted in the role, and suddenly I had an idea. I said, listen, what if late in the movie um, we have a scene where when Cohen knows he's going to die, they're driving along and he sees a mailbox on the side of the road. And he pulls off to the side of the road, gets out of the car, takes out an envelope, puts money in it. This envelope's pre-addressed. We know it's to a daughter, a wife, a loved one, but someone he cares about. Um, and he, he puts the money in the envelope and he mails a letter. So we establish that he does have somebody else out there beyond the, the other two characters. And Shatter, he smiled and he said, that does it for me.
that was really the instinct he had there. That was an example, I would say, that happened a few times making the movie, um, where, you know, I was able to, he would have an idea and I'd, I'd find a way to make it work. And it was always, um, it, it always really improved the movie. Going back, I, re I remember summer of 89, waiting for a friend to pick me up to take me to go see the 1989 Batman movie. And I remember I was thumbing through a premiere magazine and I saw this full page ad for Cohen and Tate um, coming to VHS. And I swear I wanted to see that movie more than I wanted to see Batman. Um, but it but it bothered me that I didn't know about this movie. It wasn't uh, advertised. I didn't hear much about it. And I would have gone to the theater to see that, you know, probably two or three times. Or was there an issue with the distribution of the movie? Because I always felt like it never got a fair shake at the box office. It never did. Uh, it, it, it had a, it had terrible distribution, which was, you know, out of my hands at that point. I mean, it, the film, I mean, which has happened on a few of my movies, by the way. Sure. Oh, yeah. The film was ultimately discovered at Blockbuster. Uh, you know, it, it, the film had come out, I think it, they opened it in 131 theaters somewhere in the Midwest. You know, it was some bullshit release. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, I, th I pretty much felt the film was going to end up in obscurity. Um, but, like, about a year or two later, I was at a local blockbuster, and I saw the VHS of Cohen and Tate, like, featured on the rack, and it said, customer favorite. And nice. So between that, between, um, you know, so, uh, cable showings, and finally, ultimately, with uh, the beautiful Shop Factory, and also later, uh, shortly thereafter, Arrow, uh, Blu-ray of the movie it was it it was the film was ultimately discovered some years later did it get a fair shake in foreign markets because i've seen a lot of like japanese posters and german posters for it yes it did actually i mean the uh, uh they if they loved it in europe british film institute actually uh ran the movie they they took it all around england on a double bill with the getaway it's actually a pretty good double bill there uh because the conan tate's really kind of a 70s movie it is it's got it's got a lot of the the sort of the the grit and the vibe and the you had uh victor j kemper who filmed uh dog day afternoon in 1975 uh, as your dp that had to have been something that was why i hired him based on that movie awesome yeah, so you were going for that gritty 70s vibe all along speaking of which Roy made a lot of great movies in the 70s. I'm just curious. I mean, he was obviously on your radar. I think you developed Cohen for Roy Scheider. Um, are there any other movies of his that, you know, are among your favorites or that you really enjoy? Yeah, Marathon Man, which I guess was also a somewhat deadly character. That he, uh, not more than two, but very deadly character that he played in that. But also a guy who had a tremendous, you know, tremendous love for his brother and had a lot of heart and was a pretty well-rounded human being, but was also an assassin. Um, but yeah, it was Jaws, uh, Marathon Man, Blue Thunder. I mean, all, all, oh, and The French Connection, of course. He just had a, I'm from New York originally, and you know, he was sort of, to me, kind of like the ultimate New York actor. He, he just was, he, he radiated it. He was just in, in, in a string of like totally great, you know, just badass movies, and Cohen and Tate certainly one of them. Um, it's, Jaws actually has one of the ultimate Shider moments. That's very much, you know, it's the scene where he's ladling the chum, and the shark appears, and he yeah. he just sits up. He has this blank look in his his face. See, that was mm -hmm. very much part of Roy's technique. You know, he he believed that the script was the writer's until he came up with the physical gesture. Like literally, he had to communicate it physically. You know, he would come up with a physical gesture or expression for that moment, then it became his. And that was the perfect, he knew that there was no way after seeing that shark, there was no big expression you could do. The best thing to do was to have no expression. And mm -hmm. that was the kind of, that, that's what made him so enthralling to work with. You know, because he, he really would find the right body language or look or expression to sell the scene. One of my favorite 
moments making that movie, I mean, was we just we had, we took about 15 minutes. I needed to get some shots in the rear view mirror of Cohen's eyes, uh, just because I knew we were going to use them throughout the movie and the cutting. So I remember sitting in the car with Shider with the camera in the back seat, filming, and I was just sat next to him, and I gave him different. Um, and all we were focused on, all the camera was focused on, was his eyes reflected in the rearview mirror. Uh, I would give him different uh, emotions, anger, suspicion, this, that, or the other. And it was fascinating. And he just watched it. And it, it like his eyes changed perfectly. He was such a craftsman, such a, a fantastic craftsman. I mean, it's something the old stars or the older stars were really good at. I mean, it, I, I was very lucky to have him in my first film, really. I really think his performance in Cohen and Tate is pitch perfect in basically every scene. Uh, he, he's he's fully into what he's doing there. Uh, he was certainly my first choice to play Cohen. Uh, it would, the company never thought we'd get him. Uh, so we actually <laughs> had to make offers to a few other actors before we, we, we they, they had the nerve to make an, an offer to Shatter. But I knew Shatter would do it. Uh, because Cohen has, um, you know, he's he has a lot of. It's a darker version of a lot of the the values that uh, Roy brings brings to roles. I mean, he, you know, he in his way he's heroic, he's tough, he's he's, you know, um, but you know, but he's also Cohen. Even though he's, you know, he's a he's a hitman. He's also kind of a samurai. You know, he's got a code of honor. A lot of things that in terms of, I, I think it would, I felt that Roy would would want to do the role because it would give him a chance about to do that kind of archetypal uh, movie gangster character that James Cagney would play or Alan Delon or Yves Montand. Real. So I wasn't surprised when, uh, when the, I wasn't surprised when he took the role. So much is dependent on casting, you know, I mean, it, it, it is what they say, 50% of a movie, you know, and, and you have to be so careful with casting and, um, but, you know, you know, because a script is really only going to get one, you, you have a unique, as a screenwriter and a screenwriter director, you have an absolutely unique symbiotic relationship with your star because the, um, you know, that role is only going to get played once, probably. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, the, the actor, the star that you cast playing it, you know, they, they embody it. So you definitely, uh, you want to make the most use of them and trust their instincts because they, they're ultimately, they're the ones that have to breathe life into it. I mean, what was it like directing him once you guys started filming? What, what can you share just about working with Roy Scheider other than what you already have? <laughs> well, you know, I mean, um, we rehearsed for a week, uh, which was which I always do, because uh, I that it, it really gives the chance for the you know the actors to to get the get the script on its feet, and you you, you just in, inevitably you, you know it, it gives them a chance to completely get into the characters and develop the release like the relationship. We mostly I mostly rehearsed with Adam and Roy because uh, children don't mm -hmm. you know t uh, Harley Cross was very young and really wasn't it didn't really have the energy or focus to do rehearsals but but roy and i rehearsed the whole thing pretty much like a play um and we definitely developed a rapport in the relationship between those two characters um there were only a few major directions i gave roy um to be quite honest with you i mean he, he was a movie star he knew what he was doing he knew where the camera was he knew how to play the scene i mean um but the, when he first came, the, in the first rehearsal, he came in and he started reading the script with a very broad um, Jewish accent, which was good. But I felt that because the uh, character he was playing was would be kind of exotic for his fans, they weren't used to seeing Roy play a hired a contract killer, you know, a, a straight on bad guy like that. It, it put a wall between the audience and the character. And I thought I told Roy to play it straight to make to make the character as accessible as possible in terms of his accent and his manners that was probably uh him him trying to separate himself from martin brody you know because <laughs> he that, that always haunted him throughout his career it was oh it's the guy in jaws you know 
and he was in so many other great movies. So he's probably trying to get that accent in there just to kind of further separate from Martin Brody, maybe. Sure. Uh, you know, I mean, it, it. I mean, it was probably authentic for the character to, to to play it that way. It just, it just the way the way he ultimately did play the role, I think, is accessible to the audience. You know, he's like Humphrey Bogart or Lee Marvin or somebody like that. You know, they 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 had a they they kind of. You knew what Humphrey Bogart and Lee Marvin sounded like. We know what Roy Schneider sounds like. So we, we stuck to that. But he was really quite fearless. I had something in the script which none of the producers thought he would uh, he would ever go for, uh, which was a hearing aid, you know, because I, I, I felt that, um, you know, you've got this guy who's such a formidable killer that he needed something to humanize him, some kind of vulnerability and that the hearing aid was a nice touch but Roy had no problem with that but but at two o'clock in the morning one night he called me up and you remember Roy he, he talked very fast he said hey mm-hmm. Eric, you know listen as long as we get the hearing aid let's use it let's let's find a scene for it uh you know but like what if he lost the hearing aid and he couldn't hear and of course that's a that's brilliant, great. That, that brilliant idea and immediately when he said that I said at a I, I thought of having to get the kid who he's, he's kidnapped, who he's taken back, probably be killed, but having to enlist this kid to help him find the hearing aid. Um, so that scene in the movie, that came out of Roy's, that, that was one of Roy's ideas. You know, he didn't throw ideas at you very often, but when he did, they were all really, really good like that. And we're, we were able to actually take it. I mean, I think I wrote that scene that night and we, we shot it the next day. You know, actors of, I think, you know, his generation, you know, they were, they were tremendously prepared. Um, they had a great base and craft, um, but also, you know, they, you know, the great stars knew how to bring the audience in. They knew how to find something about the character that that made the audience pull for them. You know, I mean, you you, you don't really root for Roy Scheider and Colin and Tate, but you feel for him. You get you get involved with him and his his finale. I mean, I think his final moments in that with the cornered by the police, that's some of Scheider's best work ever. The end of that movie, and I guess I'll say, if there's anyone listening that is intrigued by this movie and hasn't seen it yet. Pause right here. Go watch the movie. <laughs> I'll put links uh, below the video. But go watch it and then come back. But spoiler warning on, here we go. I've always thought, I think the end of Cohen and Tate is the most shocking ending to a movie I've ever seen. Really? Yes, because like I was saying, I, I remember watching it the first time and I was like, you know, what is this movie? It's just, you know, it's, it didn't play at the theater near me anyway. And, and I'm processing this movie and it's so different. But that ending where he turns around with, with that gun and ends his life and that huge sound of the, the gun going off <laughs> and then it just goes to black. I was just, my jaw dropped. <laughs> I can't think of another movie that has an ending like that. There might be a few that maybe come close 
to some degree, but but not like that. That was a trademark in 70s movies, from French Connection to Dirty Mary, Crazy Larry to quite a few other films. It was an abrupt ending. The movie ended on a, off in a freeze frame, but some shocking final jolt that then you went straight to credits. I, 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 and, and you're sent out of the theater still reeling because, you know, there was, not, there, was no, there was no easy letdown at the end of the movie. So, yeah, it was very much a 70s, a 70s ending. I'm amazed that the movie was released like that just as a studio would be bold enough to let a movie in like that even. Was that even a problem when you have your lead protagonist in their life like that? Well, I mean, remember, his character is a samurai. And, you know, seppuku was, you know, that it was a, it was the honorable way for a samurai to die. So sure. that, that really is what it is for Colin at the end, and end his life on, the, on, his, on his own terms. Did the producers ever want to push you into a happy ending? Oh, here, here's your little boy back, and everybody hugs, and he goes off to jail. Like. Oh, no. Everybody was pretty much, uh, while we were making the film, was really behind the movie we were making. Again, we were trying to make something that was... Well, of course, Conan Tate is really a reverse buddy buddy movie, which was a popular genre then. You know, I mean, it was, it has a lot of the dynamics of a buddy buddy movie. But uh, of course, black is pitch because these two guys are, are both dangerous, you know, hired killers. That's part of where I think the humor in the movie, kind of, some of the humor in the movie comes out of. What did, uh, what did Roy think of that ending? How was he? Did he ever comment on it or do you remember the day you filmed that anything you can share because again it's it's an amazing ending to a movie he just played the hell out of it no i mean that was always built in uh you know i mean he, he bought the ending because that was the ending that was the the right ending for the movie and his character um mm -hmm. i can remember filming it just his i mean he, you know at that point in the movie he's all shot to pieces and you know he's a mess i mean He's, he's like a cornered rat when all the cars are surrounding him. I mean, he he really took that that moment in his teeth. It's it, it it's not just the when he shoots himself. It's a, at the end. It's that one shot where he's got the boy with the gun to his head, and the per, the police pretty much finally corner him, and he's he's like a he looks like a rat. didn't have, have any vanity issues at all. I mean, he, he, he played that guy like that guy should be played, you know, and that, that was, again, something that, uh, you know, I think that the great stars really aren't afraid of. And, and you know, I think that's, he made it a very three-dimensional human being. Yeah, it was just an amazing scene. Um, another scene that sticks out to me with, with, with Scheider is when he takes out the gas attendant. He looks like almost like a king cobra or something, the way he stares that guy down, the predator and the prey. Total menace in that scene. Do you remember directing him in that, or did he just do these things, or? Yeah, I'd be setting the camera and would explain to him the shot. And, you know, we'd, we'd rehearsed it, we knew what the moment was. I mean, certainly that whole, the point of that scene was to show that even though there are human values that Colin reveals during the course of the story, we never lose sight of the fact that this guy's cold-blooded killer who will not hesitate to do what he needs to do to get out of a situation. 
like, you know, the, the scene with the gas station attendant calling the police. Um, so that was one of Roy's like directly villainous moments. But that one there, there's 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 one tracking close up of him over him to the boy where he his eyes follow the gas station attendant in and he's just repped. Oh, yeah. It was actually funny because there were two scenes in the movie. He he referred to his father. Um, now his father was supposedly the super nice guy, but <laughs> the, the, the close up when Cohen is first introduced in the farmhouse when they they blast the farmhouse, he walks mm -hmm. in a close up and he looks over the room and he he gives a look to Tate of absolute just disdain. <laughs> I asked Roy, where did, where did that moment come from? And he said, that's the look my father used to give me when I did something wrong. Uh, oh, that's funny. And he said also the scene with the, him and the kid in the car had a little bit of that. He, he almost channels uh, George C. Scott in a way in, in that opening scene when he first walks in. The first time you see him, it, you're just not used to seeing Roy Scheiner like that. He's, you know, he's gray, um, he's aged, and uh, Cohen doesn't like Tate. He hates Tate, and he hates being assigned to Tate. I mean, he hates the fact they even put anybody on this job with him. He's worked alone. Yeah, everything about this job is bad, and he's got a sense of doom. He, I think he knows he's running out of time. All of this creates a gravitas in the character, but not just does he object a maniac like Tate being assigned to him, um, but he, he despises Tate's methodology. He thinks that Tate is nothing but a bloodthirsty psychopath. In fact, that scene where, they, where they, they break into the farmhouse, their characters are somewhat defined by the way they kill. You know, Schrader's one shot, uh, you know, and Tate comes in blasting with a shotgun, the scene that was actually much bloodier in the, in the original cut. Um, you know, so who these two characters are is fairly, is pretty much established without dialogue in that first scene. A Adam Baldwin was completely opposite of Roy was that intentional like he was tall versus Roy being shorter uh, young versus old their total personalities are different yeah ab absolutely they had to be you know you had to have you had to have two uh, for conflict and for you know dramatic parts you had to have two completely different personalities um, who are in constant conflict and and not good conflict and in in conflict that's that's barely you know that could turn lethal at any time and cohen's control over tate is is rapidly dwindling as the movie progresses because that's what the little boy observes right at the beginning and what he you know in a kind of survival of the fittest situation what he kind of cunningly exploits he he pushes all their buttons to get them his only way to survive because he's small and vulnerable and unarmed is to get these two guys to do what they do best to each other now um you had a great composer um for cohen and tate bill conti and uh just being a musician myself i'd be remiss not to ask what was it like working with him uh, connie was good you know i mean he the, I, I wanted to do a sort of a classic thriller style score, which even in the 80s was sort of beginning to, it, it's not that it was out of vogue, but it was it was sort of a throwback kind of score to more like the, again, the 70s and the 40s and, you know, something that involved the string orchestra. And, you know, Bill was pretty expert at that. Um, I think his best cue, actually, in the, in the, in the whole movie um, is the, the roadblock cue, uh, because that was an extremely hard scene to score, um, to get the right build of tension. And in fact, uh, we got on the recording stage and he, we recorded what he originally wrote and I threw it out and I basically had him basically write it on sound stage. Uh, and it was fantastic.
you know, it, it just needed something else to build the uh, to build the right propulsion. It is a great uh, key. I know exactly what you're talking about. That and that scene is that scene. You know, it's so believable how you execute that and how they get out of that mess. Um, and uh, certainly the music adds to that credibility. Uh, but that that is a great uh, tense scene. There's just a few really solid tension filled sequences in that that movie. I love the 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 sequence before you know Cohen finally has had it with Tate, you know, and, and he's like, "That's it," and he pulls his gun and, and and shoots him. I love the the building tension there as well, and the score really helps underplay that. I mean, how do you construct that and know it's going to turn out to be so? suspenseful or tense you know the, just use the roadblock as an example we've already established what these guys can do so what i love about that scene is nothing happens really i mean they shoot shoot a couple cars you know but there's the the absolute potential for you know knowing who these two guys are uh i, I mean through that scene the, it's really all about the threat and the potential of what can happen and actually, as I get older and make more films, it's it, it interests me a lot more, really, than action and gore. I think I um, I did a movie called A Hundred Feet, which was all about that. It was all about the potential of things happening and what you think's going to happen, and sort of playing with audiences' expectations. But yeah, that scene and the first scene at the farmhouse probably are now are my two favorite scenes in the movie because they're. The farmhouse is full of mystery at the beginning. I mean, who are these people? You know, why are there why are there FBI guys there? You know, what's happening? Who cut the wires? You know, what's coming? Yeah, you were channeling a little bit of John Ford in that, like the Searchers. Oh, I more than channeled it. I, I, <laughs> I, we 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 have we have a phrase we love to use in Hollywood called "remage," rip off homage. That scene was a total homage to the Searchers. Yeah. That's, which is such a great scene in the uh, in the in the Ford picture. Oh, directors do it all the time. We all use or or iterate scenes from other movies we we love and do it differently. I mean, I, there's a scene in The Hundred Feet that was inspired by Rolling Thunder. You yeah, you actually when I think of it, uh, body parts. There's a scene that I always thought he's doing the Cohen and Tate mailbox scene where he takes the diary at the end and he signs it to his wife and he puts it in an envelope, puts it in his mailbox. Do you remember that? I do, but you're going to be, you're probably going to be surprised to know that it never occurred to me once. You're the first person who's ever mentioned it. And I have to think about that now because maybe it was <laughs> it kind of never a subconscious to me. thing. Um, no, it's very similar, but it's a good, it's a good hook or what, you know, <laughs> put it in more movies. You know, I, I could see Cohen and Tate being a play. I mean, was there ever any thought of that or just in how it was constructed? I could see, you know, if you had a some kind of ingenious car set, you could probably pull that off on stage. Mm. You know, I don't know if I've if I could if I could see that particular movie being done, that uh, being done as a play. I mean, I, I know when I wrote it um, because it was a time in Hollywood where if you had a couple of scripts produced you could you could you could pretty much write a script and then take it to a company and said yeah I'm a, I want to direct this one and get the job that was wasn't very hard to do at the time so uh, but you know you, you had to, uh, when I wrote Cohen and Tate I, I didn't write a 50 million dollar movie I, I said I'm going to write something that is basically three people in a car and some locations and going to keep production really simple only to find out by the way that that has its own built-in problems because when you're inside, I, no sooner did I start shooting than I realized you had to shoot every scene in the car from 14 angles in order to have enough interesting, I mean, interesting stuff to cut with visually. So I, I learned on that movie that contained movies had their challenges. Yeah, well, that's good. You had uh, Victor Kemper there with you. I, I, I did notice some of the, on, on Blu-ray it looks stylized, but some of the lighting rig shots in the background, I mean, you can kind of, tell it's a set but it, it kind of looks good in hd actually you know i mean I, I was never happy with the car shots uh the ones that we did that we shot on the stage the ones that had the the pronounced lights in the background because vic um put the put a string of lights on a on a on a track 
and moved it. Uh, it was what they call poor man's process. Um, and I felt that like um, I had him add like red tail lights, you know, so there was a key light, backlight, fill light. The the lights were constantly changing in the car, so it was visual. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't think we ever sold the uh, those. It looks the the bulk of the car shots, or a, a lot of them, look like you're on a stage when they get off the highway. Like around the time they had the confrontation at the gas station, we reduced those lights to just a few in the background, and that those shots we sell. We just, I think, we just used too many. I was never yeah. fully, I, I was never technically fully happy with the with the car shots. Do you recall what the budget was for Cohen and Tate? I think the movie with Scheider and you know the above the line all in probably around six million, forty five days to film it, so. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't really that low budget. Um, there was plenty of time to shoot it. You know, we had a symphonic score. It was considered at the time to probably be a, a, a medium, medium range budget movie. So there were obviously greater plans for it, and the just the, the distribution just fell through. Um, because of course, you, I mean, Roy was coming off 2010 and maybe 52 pickup before that. Well, uh, closer to the truth was that one of the producers was an executive at the company who was fired during the course of the making of the movie. Nothing to do with our film. And I think that there was a lot of, there was a, a genuine, a, gen, uh, a, a general lack of uh, support to an ex-executive's film. And that was... Oh, wow. So that has happened to me more than once. You know, if there's, cha if there's corporate changes that are adverse, that's gonna, you know, shit's gonna roll downhill. So it kind of it looks like MGM owns the movie now, and they seem to be doing a better job of getting it out there. I know it's available on DVD. I see it from time to time on uh, Amazon Prime. Shout Factory uh, did a beautiful Blu-ray of the movie about a couple years ago. Oh yeah, I've got it. <laughs> it's available on a Blu-ray edition here, and also the uh, Arrow did a beautiful one. You know, I think the real reason probably the Conan Tate you know, it took a while to find its audiences. Um, I think it's more, the movie is more in tune with today's sensibility than it was with the 80s sensibility. You know, the 80s were flash dance. The 80s were very upbeat and optimistic and flashy and fun. Conan Tate's are really dark. I mean, I saw it again for the first time uh, at Alamo Draft House. It is a screening that I attended a, a, a few months ago. And watching it, I thought it was a pretty dark picture. Uh, but today's audiences, at least right now, have a far more hard-nosed sensibility for its characters and stories, um, and it's reflected in the movies and the shows that are made. Uh, I think that the 80s were just a more innocent time, so I don't think that Colin and Tate was really in sync with the era it was released in. But uh, it was fortunate enough to be discovered in our era. Well, I hope people find out more about it, and... Um... I think Scream, uh, Scream Factory or Shout Factory, they ought to put out a, a box set of your movies because so many of them have that distribution aspect holding them back. Uh, 100 Feet, for example. Yeah. Um, that's got to be frustrating. 100 Feet was, was bitterly frustrating because it is a first-class motion picture. You're free to move anywhere within a 100-foot radius. If you go past a 100-foot perimeter, an alarm activates. If the alarm continues for more than three minutes, the signal will automatically be sent and the cops will be dispatched to the scene immediately. Any violation automatically adds 10 years to your sentence. You get it? Do you get it? Yeah, I get it.
thing, Father. Could you bless this house for me? No. They put a lot of money, they put money into it. You know, we filmed it in Brooklyn. We built the entire house in, in Budapest. You know, we had a, a, there's a brilliant performance by its lead actress. Um, it's a very, very elevated, um, old school, you know, suggestive ghost story uh, that audiences love when they see it. Um, but we made the film, uh, you know, uh, we, we finished the film in 2008 right at the beginning of the economic collapse and our timing. I mean, if it, it wouldn't, if it had been six months later, we wouldn't have gotten the movie made at all. I mean, you're always subject to sort of like the economic landscape and you can't, you know, you can't predict, you don't know what the world's going to be like. You start a movie and two, it's going to come out two years later. You don't know what the world's going to be like then. I mean, the biggest example that i had was with body parts where we made the movie and we had, we had a we, we did actually have a big paramount release with that and two weeks before the movie came out they caught jeffrey Dahmer. so <laughs> and then paramount pulled the ads in milwaukee where the movie was so it became front page news and there was a public identification with the movie and jeffrey Dahmer, which of course is absolutely ridiculous you know, cause... and look at how they like jeffrey Dahmer now <laughs> with this <laughs> netflix show uh, but you know i mean part one of the great things about blu-ray and before that cable is that it gave chances the hitcher didn't do very well when it came out you know but it was discovered on hbo you know i mean there's so many there's so many ways now that uh from disc to you know streaming that um audiences can can find find movies that they may have missed before that i i've been very lucky in that i've had a couple of my films like body parts and bad moon really get discovered with their with their blu-ray releases now bad moon i remember uh renting that uh just because i was like hey it's the guy who made cohen and tate <laughs> i think that's one of the best i mean it, and i see it online people referring to it as one of the best uh werewolf movies ever made because it's 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 really great it, it's it's a really nice compliment which is ameliorated slightly by the fact that there's only a couple of good werewolf movies. Most werewolf <laughs> movies are shit. They really are. If you look back for a monster as iconic as the werewolf, if you really look at the history of werewolf movies, there's maybe five good ones, in my opinion. Um, what I loved about uh, Bad Moon was it was its mixture of a family story and a, and a horror movie. You know, it was kind of like a horror movie with heart. And that dog was such a was such a straight ahead hero. I mean, you're rooting interest because that's how we feel about dogs, you know. That dog is amazing in that movie. Was it was it difficult uh, directing that dog and and getting that performance out of it? Yes. Uh, it, well, it took a lot of patience um, because the it was a, it took a long time to cast the dog. Uh, it took us actually six months to find the right German Shepherd um, mm -hmm. uh, because. Shepherds all, once you start looking at them for the hero role, to find the shepherd that embodied all of those archetypal, heroic, protective, loving, you know, elements that we associate with the German shepherd and, and, and could put that that came across in camera. It took us a long time to find the dog. Mostly with that dog, it took uh, patience because it was a puppy. You know, he was, I don't, I think he was a year old when we were making the movie, you know, the the close-up dog. There are only, there are only uh, basically two dogs used in the movie. He had, he had an incredible ability to lock eyes with somebody and bond, what they call bonding. The, so that's where that, you know, those hugely emotional looks the dog gives. Um, that was something the dog projected, but he had the attention span of a gnat. I would roll a 10-minute magazine of film on that dog in a close-up to get maybe two or three usable seconds. But all you need were those two or three usable seconds. You know, once you had, you know, he would, the dog would look left and right, he'd scratch, he'd yawn, he'd blink, he'd scratch his ear, and then he would bond. 
And, you know, and, and when when he did that, when we go, you know, we had the trainer right behind the camera and we just spent 10, 20, 30 minutes getting these, getting the, getting the moments. And then once you had that film, then it was a matter of putting the performance together in the cutting. But the dog gave it to you. You had a really good cast in Bad Moon. I mean, the the performances, like Michael uh, Pere, I, I don't think I've ever seen him more effective in a movie, to be honest. I mean, I'm sure there was Eddie in the Cruisers, but but I mean, he's he plays that role really well. I always I always enjoyed his performance and Marielle Hemingway as well. Well, Michael in particular, you know, I, I think it was kind of a comeback film for him, and he really brought his A game to that. And and he's like that. I've worked with him twice now. Mike is one of these actors that no matter what movie he's making, he treats it like he, he, he approaches every movie and brings his best. And he had a, he has a wonderful quality of being, um, he, he's able to project performance through physicality, through expressions, you know, because a lot of his Uncle Ted and Bad Moon, there's whole scenes that are based on just looks between him and the dog. Um, Mike is really good at that. It, it, it's in Eddie and the Cruisers. He, you know, it, he has that similar kind of quality, this kind of animal magnetism. Um, he's a super skilled actor, uh, and he was also great in that he worked with the dog constantly. Um, which, if you're doing a movie with a dog, you and that's going to have a lot of scenes with your main character, it, it really, really helps if your actor spends a lot of time with the dog and develops, you know, a personal rapport, which Mike did. Yeah, I love well, I, I love Gray. I've I, I worked with him any time I can. Screen Factory, you should consider. I'm going to send him this. Um, we need a box set with uh, Body Parts, Bad Moon, 100 Feet, and Cohen and Tate. we got to get Undertow. Yeah, am I, am I missing any others? Oh, Undertow, yep, with uh, Lou Diamond Phillips. <laughs> I'm working on that right now. I've got a 35. Uh, my, my pals in Alamo Draft House somehow managed to find one of the only, the only existing 35 millimeter print of the film. So I'm, I'm working on getting a Blu-ray done of that. That's that, that, that that's a really nice little movie with uh, Blue Diamond Phillips and Mia, Mia Sarah uh, and Ferris Bueller. She and I went to the same high school. You went to school with her? That's cool. Yeah, we now you've transitioned. You, you've been doing a, a lot of novels. I know some of them are in consideration or in production for, for films. With the movie business being as difficult as it is to transition and, and write and put out all these great novels... I really admire that, that you're, you're just continuing to be creative. Um, are there any novels you'd like to discuss? I know White Knuckle and Stopping Power are a couple of your, your most recent. I know they're in development to, to be films. Um, White, White Knuckle is, um, it's, has been optioned uh, to be filmed. It's closely they're starting that this year. You know, and the, uh, I have a Werewolf Western series which is kind of one of my front burner projects right now called The Guns of Santa Sangra about a Three American gunfighters who protect a, a Mexican town from werewolves. It's it's a it, it's sort of a, a mix of the two genres I love the best. Um, That's great. It's, it's a very very dark kind of exploration of, of werewolves um, and the sort of the tragic origins of them. That that's going to be a fun picture. I've been working on that one for a while now. Well, that that definitely should be made. I mean, especially by the guy who made Bad Moon. <laughs> I mean, come on. Who doesn't want to see that? A Western with werewolves. I, I saw you were making a Bigfoot movie or, or a Yeti movie. or what was, What's that? What's going on with that? I've got a Bigfoot movie called No Man's Ridge that really, um, the whole inception of it was kind of as a way to kind of give something back to the sort of the 70s creature feature genre because like a lot of kids, you know, guys my age, uh, you know, we, we grew up with, uh, you know, we, we grew up watching triple feature horror movies. It was the, you know, it was you know, AIP style movies. Legend of Boggy Creek. You know, that's that's probably the only good Bigfoot movie ever made. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was actually a really, it's a very interesting movie. I think it was probably the first faux doc 
I mean, correct mm-hmm. me if I'm wrong, but I don't think anybody had done done a movie that was basically a, a dramatized documentary, not a real documentary. But they they made it look like a real documentary. It's a you know, it was it was a big success. It was G rated. You know, they there was a drive in movie, um, and a lot of people have a lot of nostalgia for that movie because it was the one scary movie their parents would let them watch on TV and and so they have a lot, a lot of my friends had memories of kind of like curling up with their folks and watching it was very it's very non it's not violent or anything yeah bigfoot was was like a big deal in the uh, in search of bigfoot was on TV all the time and yeah bigfoot was a big deal he still is i mean look at all these reality shows but I'll, I'll, I'll say this, like you were saying about werewolf movies, there really hasn't been, you know, a Jaws of Bigfoot movies, you know, like the ultimate Bigfoot movie. It looks like if anyone could do it, it'd, it'd be you. Can you tell us anything about the, the story or um, when to expect that? That's our goal with this. We're, we're trying to make the ultimate Bigfoot movie because it's, you know, it's America's monster. You know, it, it's our it's, Bigfoot is is an American creature. You know, it's, it's our Loch Ness monster for, for Scotland, and it's it's really part of our mythology. Um, you have to treat Bigfoot carefully though, because you can't do an alien or predator with Bigfoot, because people love Bigfoot. You know, it's he's he basically stays to himself. You know, he he's not bothered. But in our story, in in the movie, um, a woman. Uh, a, a, a young woman's father, who's a naturalist, disappears while uh, tracking down Bigfoot, and she goes to basically sets up a rescue mission to find him. But she recruits to kind of protect her and her boyfriend uh, three extreme hunters who are on the trip to basically bag Bigfoot. They want to be the first hunter to bag Bigfoot. Um, so they go. Um, they they go into the deep woods. They get dry, They get choppered into the deep woods in Wyoming and uh, they p- pretty soon encounter Bigfoot and one of them fires the one of the hunters fires the first shot and they provoke Bigfoot and that's a big mistake and basically <laughs> then it becomes your real it, it, it is it is a head tearing arm ripping toy tearing in half bloody exciting practical special makeup effects movie it's a t- it's it's a total throwback to the AIP movies um, except with better characters. Awesome. Uh, uh, so it, it, it's, a, it's a fun movie, pure and simple. It, it's one of the, uh, oddly enough, it's, it's one of the movies I most want to make just because it's, uh, I love monster movies. Well, just so you know, <laughs> I had a guy hit me up one time wanting to score a Bigfoot movie and I made all this music for him and he, he never, uh, I never heard from him again. So if you ever need a stockpile of Bigfoot music, hit me up. <laughs> um, Listen to it. Sure. Um, but uh, as far as I was just going to ask, like you were writing these, you know, the Hitcher, Near Dark, Cohen and Tate. Um, you're writing these movies in your mid twenties. <laughs> how how did you get such of a an instinct for writing these types of crooked characters and macabre situations? Where does that come from? When, when most people in their 20s are losing their innocence, you were writing, you know, these movies. God, I don't know. Um, usually for me, probably the story. Um, as a writer, I've always sort of come up with a story idea first and then find that the characters kind of come out of that. Some people do it the other way around. You know, with The Hitcher, uh, I'd been... I'd always loved the Doors song, Riders in the Storm, and thought that yep. would just be a fantastic opening for a movie. And when I left New York and went to Texas and had a long drive, you know, to Austin, kind of the movie fell into place. But, you know, it was the, you, know, you try to follow a logic. You know, it was like, okay, this kid picks up a hitchhiking killer, he escapes the killer, you know, then what? Um, so I came up, I got the idea that the hitcher was framing. Uh, you know, for, for the killings. And then the question becomes, why is he doing that? You know, and that's that's sort of, it was sort of thinking along those lines that the characters fell into place. I mean, the most important thing when you're writing a, a bad guy or a villain or a serial killer or whatever, that you they, they must have a lot, you know, because it, the biggest mistake, and you see it all the time, is when 
people just write, you know, evil slashers who are just evil for no reason. Right. You know, the the the, the best thrillers have, you know, that have the best dawns. The the characters have a logic. I mean, it may be a twisted logic. It is definitely a twisted logic, but it makes sense to them. And so it, it's sort of incumbent on the writer when you're working in this genre to, 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 you know, explore the psychology. And and you know, you follow different logic. Like in Bad Moon, like when I've when I've when I've dealt with uh, quote unquote monsters, like say a werewolf. I mean, my first thought is to say, you know, why does this myth resonate? But, you know, why why do we love werewolves? Why why it's like with vampires? Why is there? Why are we fascinated by it? Um, and I guess with with werewolves, I I felt that you know when you really think about it, these are kind of an analogy for alcoholism. You know, somebody who's a decent person, you know, is, but they they have this bad. They're cursed. They're bit. You know, and that uh, you know the the werewolf in them, the beast in them winds up kind of taking over their, um, you know, taking away their humanity. So, um, and then I thought like with Bad Moon that what was interesting about that I, I didn't usually see in werewolf movies was the idea that the werewolfism, so to speak, would actually begin taking over the, de- the, the, the man who was turned into a werewolf during the day. And Michael, Michael's performance, we, we, we explored that. I mean, you see, mm-hmm. as the movie progresses, he's becoming less and less a loving brother and more some kind of sociopath. Uh, so that was very, very deliberate in that to make the character even scarier because you kind of had two bites of the apple. You had both right. three turns into, and then the guy becoming more dangerous. So you fo- you follow a, a, a you know you try to imagine a logic, or at least I did. What is your uh, favorite movie that you've made? My favorite movie uh, I've made is A Hundred Feet for a, a number of reasons. But the biggest reason, I think, was it's a film that, you know, is basically one woman in the house under house arrest with a ghost. And uh, it was it was a movie that only has one kill in the entire picture. And most of the, almost the entire movie had to be done the suspense had to be generated with this woman being aware she's in the house with a ghost that begins to terrorize her. And it was all about, um, I thought it was kind of my best work because it keeps you on the edge of your seat, but not with gore scenes, not with, with action. It keeps you, on, it keeps you there psychologically. And the fun of the movie was kind of creating audiences' expectations for when this ghost was going to appear or do something. And then having it not appear, and then doing the reverse, having the ghost appear exactly when he did. So that whole movie to me was about playing with audiences' expectations. And you know, Alfred Hitchcock, who's one of my favorite directors, was the master of that. You know, it's it's it's, and you know, the more movies I make, the less interested in blood and gore. It's more interesting to me to to use suggestion to to make things like not how you show it, but how you don't show it. When the audience, if you find a way to take, say, a, a scene of great violence and not graphically show it, but suggest it, the audience will fill in the blank. They'll use their own. They'll they'll bring. They'll use their own imagination to picture what happened. And when you do that, um, you know, they, they 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 become involved with the movie. They're not just an audience member. They're actually interfacing with it. It's a much more powerful storytelling technique mention Al- Alfred Hitchcock probably when I, when I think of the your movies the scene that is most Hitchcockian would be a scene that I think of whenever I'm driving somewhere and the weather's bad which is that crash scene in body parts um, which is you know because it, it presents the problem everyone can see what's going to happen and then you just wait for it to happen yep. in, in anticipation and uh, I always found that to be just an incredibly executed uh, scene and from what i understand that not all the cameras were going when you filmed the the ultimate crash was that right well all the cameras were going all right they just didn't catch it we had nine cameras in that scene uh because you know it was shot in in i, I shot it in about two and a half days on a 
section of freeway in Toronto that was under construction, so we were able to close it and, and own it and just put on AD cars. And, you know, we had a very, very qualified stunt team on the movie, and uh, I had nine cameras. Um, but it was shot in sections. You know, it was shot the, the car losing its wheel in front of Jeff Fahey's car, his skidding to a stop, stop the, the truck rear-ending him, him going through the windshield. And then the final section, we were shooting all of this sequentially, was um, basically the, the truck was going to push his car into the back of a car we had, we had placed on the freeway. It was very, and it was done at a very slow speed. Um, and the stuntman was standing on the hood of the car and he, uh, on the roof of, of the middle car and uh, was basically just supposed to jump over the top of the, the one car. But the stunt went a little off. Not We we rehearsed it. We were very, we were very safe. Um, but it, it happens. And the car flipped. So the nine cameras I had covering it, nobody was expecting the car to, to actually flip on end and throw the stuntman. Um, and so at the end of the, after it was over, of course, the first thing is, you know, are you okay? And the stuntman got up and waved. And was, um, but then you, you turn to your camera operators, and we all knew we had seen one of the best stunts probably anybody's ever caught on film. It was so hair-raising. And one after the other, I remember the looks. The camera operators shook their heads. We didn't get it. And we, we, were supposed, we were just supposed to be shooting straight ahead. And as it turned out, um, I had a couple of cameras in kind of like reinforced housings inside the various vehicles, and those were the shots that we, we got, and one high angle uh, from a, uh, on, a, on a platform. And fortunately, we had the, between those three shots, we had the whole scene. And it's, uh, in fact, even better because you're right inside the, you know, inside the wreck while it's happening. It was a lucky accident. It, it turned out great on film, that's for sure. Um, but uh, would you say body parts, you, you, you know, you've got Bad Moon, which is your werewolf movie. Let's say Near Dark's your vampire movie. 100 Feet's your ghost movie. Is is body parts your Frankenstein movie? Body parts. Well, I suppose you could say that. It's it's a transplant movie. But, yeah, it was, um, you know, it, it, it was in the land of, of Frankenstein limbs being taken off and sewn back on and put back together. Um, and I saw the opportunity in the novel to do both a psychological thriller and also a gore movie at a time when, you know, they weren't doing all, they weren't doing any of them at the studios in, in those days. So it was, it was, again, it was a kind of a wild movie to get through the studio system. Um, you know, but, uh, yeah, so yeah, I suppose you could you could dub it as it's in the land of Frankenstein's and, and labs and mad doctors and you know. Well, just trying to give Scream Factory some ideas on a box set, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, as we kind of wrap up here, I'm just wondering, just just someone uh, that's that's into movies like you, just a, as a fellow fan of movies, what are some of your favorite movies that? What do you pop on on the weekend? You know, when you're hanging out with your buddies. Well, let's see. Uh, the buddy who was over just recently, let's see, we watched um, The Devil Rides Out. I'm a big Hammer fan. Uh, oh, yeah. Um, we watched The Incredible Shrinking Man, which, believe it or not, I only just discovered. Dude, yeah. that movie, that movie is awesome. That's great. <laughs> that is, like, one of the best 50s movies ever. I mean, it, it may be the best science fiction movie I've ever seen. I mean, it, it, it's a film... Like, it, and it's a perfect example. I mean, it's a movie that, yes, it has a science fiction concept. The guy's shrinking and shrinking and shrinking to the point where he's soon fighting spiders with a pin. But the movie has this huge emotional arc. And it's a film of ideas, you know? I mean, I, 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 I was absolutely blown away when I saw it. It was all part of the conception, of course, that this guy is, like, when he's a regular guy, his life's kind of trivial. But as the smaller he gets and the more... He, the more he becomes a mythical hero, you know, he actually increases in stature as a human being as the, you know, through his bravery and his courage and his resourcefulness as the, as the movie progresses. And, you know, I love Richard Matson. you know, Duel was a big influence on my work and, you know, he had a credible ability, the author to have, to take a, a, a very, very clean, simple confrontation, Duel being the ultimate example, you know, where, 
There's no backstory. There's no subplots. He sets up a situation, you know, and and Duel, brilliantly directed by Steven Spielberg, of course, you know. Uh, but sure, you know, the whole show basically says this whole movie is going to be this guy and and this truck, and it's going to keep you interested, and it does. It it has enough. It's such a challenging thing to do because you have to keep the complications going. And I thought that Shrinking Man had a lot of those virtues. It was such a clean storyline, and it never never deviated. It showed the. I mean, it's deeply moving. It's full of a sense of wonder. But, I mean, it, it it was. So oh, yes, yeah, so that was that was, that was those were two movies that I really enjoyed. The Exorcist is one of my two favorite films. It was certainly the movie that most. Probably that and the French Connection were two of the five films that most influenced me、uh, when, when I was a kid. In terms of, I saw that movie and I, that was like, that's how you do it. You know, and I think、yeah. what I, I love about The Exorcist still is its absolute sense of realism. You know that where everything is treated absolutely realistically, the characters are completely authentic. They react to the situation in a complete authentic way,、uh, unprecedented. Special effects and set pieces, transgressive as hell. I mean, I don't know how they got that film made in the seventies. But well, I mean, you can't even imagine that scene with the crucifix and the little girl. Oh well, yeah, yeah. That's Now that's far and away, drop the mic in any in any studio movie ever made. It, it's really a bold, really bold, thrilling.、Uh, Masterwork, and it it it, it really I, I I saw I I learned almost everything originally I I learned about movies watching that film over and over. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm drawn to Freakin's films, and I'm drawn to your films, so there must be something happening there. But、uh, yeah, Exorcist, I would say, is definitely the scariest movie ever made, and of course they're remaking it now, which is just you know we've gone through a period of time. In which everything is copies, you know, or reboots or branding, and I don't know. It's just the times we live in. But nobody wanted to do what everybody else was doing. I mean, we would never would have gotten the hit from Aid if that had been the case. You know, I mean, Ed Feldman and and you know wanted to do a a, a different kind of thriller. You know, that was that would stand out. And I, I think things are beginning to cycle back that way. I mean, sooner or later, people are going to get bored with copies. But it, it really has been a dreary last ten years. Well, Eric, it's been great speaking with you. I can't tell you how much I've enjoyed it.、Uh, it's again, it's just been a treat, and、uh, I so enjoy your films sincerely. And、uh, I hope we'll be able to speak again. And I wish you the best of luck with your your future projects. I'm going to have everything linked in the description on the video. Everyone, please check out Eric's work and his novels. He's got a great imagination, and、uh, it'll, it, you can certainly escape in his work. So be sure to check it out. And so, thanks again, Eric. Thanks, Mike. It's been a lot of fun. Thanks. Thanks.
about that. <laughs> <laughs> 